and welcome to Not Your Average Lives. I'm Lori Wright, and this is my weekly broadcast where I highlight stories of change, specifically of women who chose to step it up at a time when most people think they should be slowing down or planning for retirement. I'm a coach and founder of the Not Your Average Grandma brand and the Make the Rest Your Best program. I'm also a late in life passion finder who is obsessed with helping unmotivated, passionless empty nesters like the old me see past their own perceived limits and realize they have even more opportunity to start something new and exciting now that their children are grown. If you're in that stage of life and feeling a deep sense that you want more out of life, it is my hope that one of these stories will ignite a long suppressed or unrealized desire or interest and you will see the potential within yourself just waiting to be tapped so you can do amazing things with the time you have left. I want you to stop seeing your age as a limitation and start seeing it as your superpower. No more letting age hold you back from the pursuit of a better and more passion-filled life. It's time to reprogram your brain to think differently. You are older, but age brings wisdom. You have years of experience and value that you've never had before, so it's time to tap into that and use it to fuel your future. Thank you for being here and listening to these inspiring stories of change. Now let's hear from today's Not Your Average guest. I am so excited to be interviewing my friend and sometime roommate, Beverly Courtney, as the first official interview for my show. I met Beverly last January when she and I were staying at the same hotel and attending the same event in California. As fate would have it, the weather forced her to ask me for a ride, and that was the beginning of our friendship. She has been a real inspiration to me. In fact, a conversation we had in the car at our last event led to my light bulb moment about starting this show. Beverly's can-do attitude and her refusal to let age slow her down, combined with her commitment to and love for her craft, makes her an unstoppable force. Her craft is dog training, but she actually doesn't train the dog. She trains dog owners, and she is adamant about teaching without force, intimidation, or coercion. She actually transforms the dog owner relationship from challenge and conflict to harmony and friendship. When you are with Beverly in person, don't be surprised to see her smiling at her phone as she watches videos that her successful students have sent her. So let's get to my interview with Beverly now. I am interviewing Beverly Courtney, dog trainer and friend that I met back in January. And we can talk about that story, but that was really fun. Yeah. Uh, so we are both a part of this business by design community, and it's for uh, online digital course owners. And she and I have very different businesses, but I love hers, and she has been so inspiring to me. And I just love her. We've turned into roommates. We've mm -hmm. had like we've been to California three times this year. Yeah, yeah. and she comes all the way from England, so. Yeah. She is very committed to what she does. So welcome, and I'm so excited to have you. Yeah, excited to be here, Laurie. It's great. And it's five hours ahead there, so yeah. big, big time difference. All right, so give me a little background about, you know, who you are, like how old you are, because this is a, a channel where I want to inspire people who are entering midlife and looking forward to their future and I want people to be inspired by people who are living very passionately, which you are doing. Where, um, where specifically you live, I know like exactly where you live in England. Um, and you moved there recently. I think that is a really interesting story. And just kind of like a little bit about who Beverly is. Okay. Well, uh, I'm quite north of the normal retirement age. I don't know if you want more detail than that. It'll probably be that <laughs> And I live, I live in, in Norfolk in England, which is right on the East Coast, not far from the sea, and I absolutely love it. And uh, yes, there was an interesting story of me getting here because my children had both left home and I was living uh, on the other side of the country. And I suddenly thought, I don't need to be here anymore. I can be where I want to be. So um, I thought very hard about what I wanted and what I wanted was there and my funds were here um but did lots and lots of thought about it and not only did the funds come up a bit but what i wanted became accessible and uh i was able to move here just just a year ago and uh i'm out with fields all around me and i love it out with the dogs every day 
Mm -hmm. my dog here wanting to talk to me. Um, Let me say, Beverly is 70. So she is super inspiring to me because I look, I want to be like her. (laughs) I'm 60. So in 10 years, I'm I'm excited about, you know, that decade already. So. Well, I've I've done a lot in my last decade, I can tell you. Um, I started my dog school um, at a time when everybody else is retiring and, you know, putting up their feet and finding life boring and having heart attacks and dropping dead. At that time, I was embarked on study to get the qualifications that I wanted um, to uh, start my dog school. I'm I'm a completely force-free trainer, so that there are certain qualifications I wanted which show that. And um, I ran that um, for nearly 10 years, uh, doing classes and uh, one-on-one tuition. And I decided that, I well, I discovered that because I wanted to reach as many dogs as possible with the way I work, which is not the way most dog trainers work, there's no, you do this, it's sort of, what do you want to do? It's more the way I work. I found that to reach the dogs, I had to quickly acquire some people skills, which I was always short of, um, so that I could reach the owners, because you can't reach the dogs without going to the owners. So I developed um, a method where I could explain things to them. I could break things down into little tiny steps, and I could explain things to them in a way which they totally understood. So I don't use any dog trainer speak at all no no jargon no talking about negative reinforcement and uh, I can't even think of the words myself stimulus and all that sort of thing I don't use any of that Uh, so I speak in English and this is why they understand me and so from that um, I then uh, wrote started writing some books and I wrote the first four and they went down I, I thought Nobody will buy these. It's costing me money to produce these, but I wanted to do them. And they started. How old were you when you did your first book? How old was I? Um, Probably 65, Mm -hmm. something like that, 66, I don't know. Um, But they started to sell. And to my amazement, they sold and they sold. And so I wrote three more. And uh, they're selling well. And so I've just added two more titles. So I've got nine books altogether and uh, that brings quite a lot of people to my site because I also built a site brilliant family dog Um, and um, from there I then branched into online teaching I decided to reach more people and people around the world I needed to get online and do it so that's what I started doing so tell me how you transitioned at what point did you realize that you didn't like what you were doing and what were you doing before you were training dogs? Oh, before I was training dogs, I was working in um, sales, sort of 80 hours a week on the road. I I just got that job because um, I separated from my husband and had to move to a new country with two children and I needed to earn some money fast because I didn't have any. And um, so I found this sales job. Mm -hmm. uh, and learnt a lot about sales there, which was useful. But my God, it was killing. It was a killer. It really was. And before that, you were. You, did you stay at home with your children? Were you? I was at home. I was always trying to do things. I, I mean, I'm an artist as well, so I was doing. Um, I was doing drawings, and um, for a long time, I kept goats and pedigree sheep, and I used to make uh, goat's cheese and sell that. Um, yeah. So you so, always had a little thing where you were always doing something. Little, I've always been doing something. I've always been wanting to move on to the next thing and um, do stuff. I mean, when I was working, I worked at the BBC in music for, for a few years, and I loved it. I have to say, I did enjoy it. Um, but then I got this thing. I wanted to go to art school. So at the ripe old age of twenty six. I went to art school, and people said, "You're mad. You know, you no money now. You've got." I thought, well, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And then people said, you're so brave doing this. And I said, no, it's just that this is what I want to do. It doesn't a question of bravery. It's just this is where I'm going and this is where I go. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's. I think a lot of people, though, I mean, it's brave because 
like with my situation, my parents told me what I wanted to do. I wouldn't make any money. And so I was like, okay, I guess I got to go do what makes me money. And so that's, it's brave because you were seeking what your passion was mm. and, you know, look, not looking at dollar signs or, you know, what would make you money. And, and, and some, for some people, you know, that's, it's scary because, you know, you don't know where the money's going to come from. You think, Oh, if I, you know, I was like, I want to be a social worker. And my parents were like, Oh, it's depressing. And there's no money in that. <laughs> well, I, I always just assume that money will turn up. I, I don't think about it too much. Um, I'm in the fortunate position. I can feed myself. I've got a nice house. I can look after my dogs and I've got a car. Um, that's it. It always just happens. I, I don't panic about money. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I have a question about, you know, you said you were separated. So you're kind of left on your own with your two children. So a lot of my followers are going through divorces at midlife. So at what age did your separation happen? And how did you kind of rebound from that? It was, um, oh dear, well, it all started to fall apart about the turn of the century, so that's 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So you're yeah. about 50? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a bit over that. Yeah. Um, was that scary or was that, did you see that as a an opportunity for more growth and yeah, the opportunity. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't, I just knew this is what had to be done. Mm -hmm. Had to go take this path. It wasn't a question of oh, please let me stay or anything. It was just no, this is this is it. I'm moving on, and and I'll make the best of it. And I did. Yeah, that's, the, that's the way I see things. I don't worry about where the money is going to come from. I don't worry about what anybody else will think. Well, mm -hmm. As far as possible, I don't. Um, I just think this is what I want, and that's how where I'm going. Right. And what specifically led you to dog training? I mean, I personally love dogs, and I think <laughs> if I did, if I was a dog trainer, I think I'd be super happy because <laughs> I, I think the best little things next to humans. Um, well, I love dogs, and I've had dogs ever since I had ever since I left work um, the first time to go to college. So I was able to move my days around, and I was able to accommodate a dog. Um, so as soon as I could, I did, and. Um, Quite soon, I was sort of headhunted by somebody I met in the park who said, your dog would train up very well. And so I started going uh, to obedience competitions and things and agility and working trials. That's a bit like police dog work, mm -hmm. setting and tracking and stuff. Now, it was great fun. I made up an um, a working trials champion ah. and uh, qualified about four or five dogs at different levels. Um I loved it. Traveled all over the British Isles going to shows and things. And I loved doing that. Um, so I knew I could train my own dogs. Then people started to ask me to train theirs. And you know how it sort of grows. Yeah, um, it's organic. Yeah. yeah it into, you know, business. Because I, I would always have been somebody who thought, well, I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know enough to do that. And then I discovered, well, actually, I, I know more than the people who are asking me things. <laughs> so perhaps I do know something. And gradually, I mean, as my business has grown, I realized that I have got something to give to people, that I have got answers for them. And um, as I say, I, I've developed a way of, of teaching which which produces the response quite often of, Oh, it's so simple. It's so obvious when you put it like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I know, um, one of the things about Beverly, when I'm with her, she's and she gets on her phone as we all do to check our social media who are doing online businesses. But she's like seeing her students, which are dogs, and she's mm -hmm. like, "Look at, look at this puppy! Look what yeah. he's doing!" You know, and she's so proud of her little animal students. And I think it's it's so so great that you're making yeah. such a difference in the world of uh, you know it's it's people you're making a big difference in people's lives because yes dogs are like children and if they're, they misbehave it's like oh you just it's not a it's not a fun house but well, it, 
Part of what I do is to do ordinary sort of puppy and dog training, what I'd call ordinary, straightforward house manners, you know, that sort of thing. But uh, I also specialise in growly dogs, that's uh, difficult dogs, the sort that bark frantically whenever they see another dog or a person or, or in danger of biting somebody, that sort of thing. I work a lot with those. So um, what's great is a lot of people... A lot of the owners of these dogs, they love their dog and they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. They have no idea. They may have gone to nasty trainers who's, who work through intimidation and punishment and, and you know, that has a very short-term effect. And the owner thinks, well, I, I love my dog. I don't want this happening to my dog. So that's when they keep hunting and they find me. And um, the great thing is that their, their confidence is usually shattered at that stage yeah they feel like a worm they feel they don't deserve to be on the planet because of the way people um speak to them because mm -hmm. their dog is as they are and uh, what i do is not only show them how to handle their dog in a different way i just teach their dog different skills so they don't have to be afraid uh, anymore but it builds the owner's confidence and i often get people saying you know that the, one of my courses the, the huge difference it's made is to my confidence they say because mm. i feel much happier and yeah great that's um something that I, I never realized i would manage to do through dog training all yeah. those years ago and a dog when a dog owner has confidence it makes their dog more secure i mean yeah, absolutely yeah um so one of the things that comes up a lot with our age group is yeah. technology <laughs> And so I, I'm not afraid of technology because so much stuff is so easy now because you can just Google it, right? Yeah. So, and you're not afraid of technology. In fact, you know, Beverly just switched platforms. She just took her courses and moved them all over to a new platform. And so I am just curious because I like, uh, you know, I like you know, to inspire not only through transformational stories, but also through education you know what is it you know about technology that like why are you not afraid of technology um well i started my first website um about 20 years ago when it was still fairly sort of clunky you know you had to sort of wind up the machine to get it going yeah. and make it sound to you I you were 50 then so did you yeah. have any did you have yeah. any technology skills at the time? Oh, zero. I could type. I, I could I could touch type. In fact, because I'd found touch typing so valuable all my life, um, I had two boys and I my I decided when they were very small that they were going to be fast touch typers by the time they were 12. And so when uh, computers started to come in while they were children, um, they wanted to play the games, which were very basic in those days. You know. And I'd say, right, you can play a game after you've done, to start with, like five minutes of the touch typing course it was a sort of game. And then it grew to 20 minutes. They had to do 20 minutes before they were allowed to play any games. And the result was by the time they were 12, they can both type incredibly fast, oh, that's which awesome. is a huge benefit in their life. Um, so it was just a question of putting that on the table and saying this is what we're going to do but uh, my my own website then um my son who was then he would have been like 12 or something he, he helped me with anything which was complicated yeah yeah HTML. oh my god and he could yeah. do it all um because I, I when i started just being online more i got on facebook because so i could you know, stalk my children. It's like, mm -hmm. that's what I got on social media for. And then I remember when I first joined my first Facebook group, I like didn't even, I remember when I created my first Facebook group, I didn't know how to do that. So I was like, you know, asking my daughter, well, what do I do? How do I do this? And yeah, again, you know, you can search on the, on and Google it, but yeah, I mean, it just takes experimenting and doing, and it's yeah. like, you have no fear of trying new things. Not really. No, no. I, I just, do them other people can do them so why can't i you know that person isn't cleverer than me they just sort of specialize in code yeah. and stuff um but i find that once if you if you're afraid of it will go wrong and you'll make mistakes if you if you realize you can't actually break the, the computer mm -hmm. by typing in the wrong thing you know you just fire ahead and right. do it 
right. and uh, gradually you learn code a certain amount of code as mm -hmm. you would have done and it's quite fun you begin to understand what mm -hmm. it's all about and it becomes automatic but i had no uh, technological training of any sort right. um, yeah so on typing that's that's all the more mistakes you make the more you learn about what not to do right absolutely mistakes are so, the parts so i i found um you know particularly with my business and um you know a, as a midlifer doing new things mindset has played a big part in my changes and my um just just excitement about knowing that the future is what i create so I guess I guess what I would like to know how much mindset has played a part as you've you know gone from offline to online, and if you have any specific examples where you really had to dig in and wasn't it wasn't about like physical change and doing the actions, but it was more about mental adaptation and you know learning how to just you know make your mind be positive and not negative. Well, um, you, you definitely grow when you're running your own business. You definitely grow. You have to. Otherwise, you'd just stay stuck. And I think learning that you only move forward by moving forward and finding out what's out there rather than thinking, well, that's what I did last week, so I'm going to do the same next week. It doesn't work that way. You, you'll stay in last week forever if you do that. You You have to launch forward and try things and also you don't want to be too rigid it's it's hard being a perfectionist myself you don't want to be too rigid because you don't know where the path is going to take you um you, you don't know where it'll be until you get there and uh the the fact that it can suddenly change and move on the way is is exciting and you do things which you didn't know you could do um as long as you're open to it um one thing that um I do you do have to think about what you want and realize that what you think is what creates your life as you just said and so it's no good thinking i can't do this i'm no good at this they'll look down at me because that's what will happen <laughs> you won't be able to do it uh instead of um saying yeah well i can do this and just trying it but one of the things that i found um was that i because I am prehistoric, I have this, I mean, completely healthy. I'm out with the dogs for hours every day and playing tennis this morning. And, you know, I'm, I'm very fit and healthy and I'm not on any meds or anything like that. I'm fine. But you never know what's going to happen. And um, if you listen to the news, which I never, ever do, if you did, <laughs> you'd probably just dig yourself a hole and get into it now. But I, I never listen to the news. And um, I think, well... Can, how far can I plan ahead? Because I get this idea that I look ahead a few years and then there's this great metal door which slams down in front of me and says, that's that's it, you can't go any further. So um, this I didn't like. So I started to say instead every day, well, it, what I thought was, you know, I'm thinking this because I'm 70, I'm thinking there is a, a, a limit. Um, but when I was 40, I didn't think that. Mm -hmm. you know, I just thought, oh, I'll do this or that or the other, and it'll go on forever ahead of me. I never thought of, uh, of limits in that way. So um, my new um, affirmation is, I am 40. Ah. I am 40. There is no limit to what I can do. And it does actually free up the horizon saying, yeah, I can just carry on doing what I want to do without worrying about this artificial thing, which is going to cut me off right. because yeah. I'm only 40. Yeah. Well, and, you know, 50 is the new 30. So 70 is <laughs> the new 40. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so how has your online, how has going into the online world changed you? I mean, I know for me, like just meeting people, like, you can meet a lot of people locally, but it's hard to find like-minded people. Mm -hmm. I think. And when you go online, you can get in groups with people you like. You can sign up for coaching and meet people that are being mentored. Like, uh, like I met you. We signed up for the same mentor, and mm -hmm. the group of people he has are amazing. 
Yeah. So I've just found personally that it's opened up so many new friendships that I've learned so much from people and just being around people that are, that are like me and have a lot of the same beliefs and yeah. Yeah, because you just don't meet them a lot of the time. Yeah. Right. Most of the time we come across people who live in lack consciousness and moan and complain and say, oh, well, you know, it's never going to work and look at the state of the country and you know, all of this. Uh, whereas when we're in that group, we're the total opposite. Um, one thing I like about that is that you meet people who are the same as you, but they're in completely different fields. Yes. So somebody might be teaching... Um, about um might be teaching yoga or the, there's somebody there who teaches uh people how to look after their elderly parents without losing their minds and their own minds and th there's and then there's lots of people teaching what you might expect on the internet you know more to do with internet marketing or so on but it's it's fascinating all the different fields there are and um, start a pet photography business yes yeah, there's a business for that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a business for making a pet photography business. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's there's all sorts of things like that which um which come up. And um I don't mix a lot with other dog trainers. You know, I have my ear to the ground, so I'm I know them and I'm aware of them. But uh, on the whole, uh, they are caught in lack and limitation and limited thinking. Yeah, of course that that's even the force free one. So I agree with. There's a whole huge mountain of dog trainers who I wouldn't touch with a barge pole because they believe in in hurting animals, yeah. uh, abusing the owners, and yeah. Well, uh, and I think with you too, you can reach more dogs, like you said at the beginning. Yeah, and yeah. You you know, it's about you know. I think where we come from is a place of impact and how many more people and when we have a business that's on social media then our sphere becomes larger and therefore our impact is greater and that is so great. Well, also you you find um i've got people in my courses from all around the world mm -hmm. literally all, all around the world and so you learn a lot more about other cultures whereas when i had my dog school on the ground here i was yeah. largely only meeting yeah. english people you know that there'd, there'd be um yeah immigrants and so on but mostly just English people with the same outlook same thoughts whereas um, and the same experiences whereas you meet people from all around the world and they've all got different experiences and um, one thing which is uh, one techie thing actually which is always hard to get your head around is time zones <laughs> oh I know working out that it's breakfast there and three in the morning there and you know but it, it, yeah yeah <laughs> And then all the clocks change and those change and then those don't change for another three weeks. And that, uh, yeah. but uh, it, it but what just, I love uh, about your business is it's not a business that you ever think about being an online business that you could actually get results by having an online business training dogs. You know, people think you need to be there. And so yeah. I think that's a, a really neat thing too. Well, so, I suppose it's because I, I'm training the person. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, and they're training the dog because it's a mistake that people yeah. make to think that there's something wrong with the dog. Therefore, it's the dog's fault. The dog needs fixing. Take it to a trainer. And the worst scenario is when they send it away to a six week residential place where it gets beaten up for six weeks. Because I don't know any force free places that will do that because it doesn't work. Um, I mean, you know, having residential training of the dog and you give the dog back to the same owner it doesn't work you've got yeah. to train the owner and yeah. it's not the dog's fault it's what's going on between you or maybe it's all in the owners yeah that's that's yeah. the problem um well and you're also helping any future pets that the person will have absolutely yes yeah. yes so what has been your biggest let's like i'm gonna try to wrap it up so um i don't want to keep you too long but what's been your biggest I'm all about aha moments. So I want to ask you, what's been your biggest aha moment of this past year, 2019? Um, that I can do it, that, that I can do it, that I have got stuff which is of value to people all around the world because my inbox every day tells me that of people saying, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. You've made such a difference to my life. And 
wow, <laughs> that's, uh, that's very gratifying and gives me fuel to keep going. But also that um, being a perfectionist and trying to get everything exactly as you want it, you know, things have moved on. Like I say, you, do, you don't look at what you did last week. You've got to keep moving on. And so I have a team around me now who, who um, I work with and um, being able to teach them and entrust them to do stuff. It's, yeah. it's very freeing for yourself yes. to do that. Yeah. When I met you, you didn't have your your virtual assistant. You didn't have, you were doing yeah. your ads and things like that. You didn't have I had I had just acquired my virtual assistant, but you know, she, we, we were just in the very much the training stage. Mm -hmm. She is absolutely brilliant. I have to say, yeah. I would be lost without her. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, all right. And so what are you most looking forward to in 2020 other than seeing me? Uh, well, that's October. That's not 2020. Yes. Oh, well, seeing, seeing everybody again. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, next year. Well, uh, who knows? Uh, I know it's going to be fun. I know it's going to be exciting. I know I'm going to be moving forward yet again. I might take a different turn. I don't know. Um, but with even if things stay exactly as I have them now, it's going to be exciting. I'm going to be meeting uh, well, meeting and reaching many more people. Um, and you just don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that is, is all good. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, my last question, and one, in my course, what I do is I like to people because I think in particular women too, we always think about what we did wrong and we're always, you know, we, we tend to dwell on sometimes, you know, what we see as failures instead of that they were stepping stones into a learning. Um, so I, one of the things I have them do is write down all their accomplishments. And so like focus on all the great things that you did over all the decades that you've lived. Yeah. So I would like to know what you think your biggest accomplishment of your life so far has been. Uh, what are you most proud of? Right. Just to go back a step there, you were talking about how women especially mm -hmm. uh, become introspective and, and blame themselves. It's partly the way we're brought up. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, um, we're taught to stay down there, not rock the boat. And if something goes wrong, it's got to be your fault. And you do have to get above that. You do have to, uh, um, coaching is very helpful to, to get you, and I know that's something that you do very well, um, to get you out of this, to realize that there is this whole blossoming world there. So my biggest achievement, I would say, would be my younger son who is just amazing. Um, he's doing very important research work now, and um, he is a joy. And to think that this beautiful, brilliant, um, good-looking, accomplished, talented person came from me, mm -hmm. well, it's kind of humbling. Mm -hmm. um, but also it makes me think, well, I, I got something right. Oh, yeah. Because uh, he's turned out into a, a real cracker. Well, and I think um, he has a great role model in you as a mom, too. Uh, that and should help you. Something that I think that we do as these, as these women who have started businesses, as uh, women who aren't afraid to try new things and to continue to learn and grow and not stop. Uh, and I think that is a gift, a legacy that we leave our mm -hmm. children children and our grandchildren for people who have grandchildren so i remember my grandparents being super super old and not very passionate i know my one grandmother she was a, a military wife and she never really got to do what she wanted to do she had to traipse around the country mm -hmm. with her husband and um and so i you know i think following your passion and doing finding things that you love to do is the best legacy that we can leave Absolutely. I mean, my um, my mother, um, she was always devoted to my father and the family. My father was very proud of saying, no wife of mine will have to work. You know, oh, that's fine. And she, she you know, obviously, she did lots. She did lots of entertaining for his business and so on. But when he died, 
she had nothing because we'd long since left home and um she felt she had nothing and she just quite quickly disintegrated yeah and followed him not long after and at the time i thought this is appalling um that to have all your life invested in something outside of you yeah it's got to be in you otherwise you end up like her just mm -hmm. disintegrating which was such a tragedy um so uh, i i vowed that i would never go that way <laughs> and um, perhaps that's part of what drives me now also at that stage when i was in sales and i was visiting people in their homes so often i'd go to people's homes and they'd be saying um oh i can't do that because i can't afford that and i can't do this and my back and there's it and i think that they're only 60. i, I was a bit younger then they're only 60 and they're finished they've, they've stopped and i it, it was just awful. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just onward and onward and onward. And that's why I asked the mindset question, because, I mean, it's all, yeah. like, we make our we make our environment, we make our, it's all in our thoughts, and just learning that, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I'm still learning, and I've learned so much in the past year uh, that I'm trying to now share with the people that, that I help. So, um, yeah, it's been so great um, getting you on here and, having you be my first interview. <laughs> She's been my guinea pig. Um, so, you know, for people who have misbehaving dogs, unhappy dogs, where can they find you? Um, the easiest place to find me is at brilliantfamilydog.com. Okay. Brilliantfamilydog.com. Yeah. All right. And so I will see you online and I will see you in October. All right. Thank you very much, Laurie. I hope that somebody has got something from this mad dog lady and, and realized, yeah, I'm interested in something totally different, but I can do it. Yes. And like, you never know. Like you said, you don't even know what you're going to be doing next year. You love what you're doing now, but you're so open for new things. And yeah. It, yeah. That's, that's, it's the journey, right? Yeah. It's the journey. That's, it's not like, you know, that's the other thing is I, my goal setting course, it's like, yeah, we're working on goals, but I so want people to know it's about the process that you go through in reaching them and the person you become. And it's not like necessarily the end result because you, you know, I veer, you know, you never know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So thank you so much. Okay, then. Bye. Good night. <laughs>